Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Jacob. I'm the chief curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to our closing session of the conference, uh, entitled The Next Assignment, a panel discussion. We've heard a great deal about NACA over the past two days from some of the best scholars working in aerospace history. It certainly has been an informative and an insightful series of presentations, and I'm sure I speak for everyone in thanking all the participants for preparing your papers and uh, attending the conference to present them. I also would like to offer uh, some closing uh, thank you comments to the organizers of the conference, as well as all of the support staff from both the Air and Space Museum and NASA uh, who have put this together the past couple of days and, and, and pulled off such a successful event. Uh, you've all done a wonderful job, and I think I speak for everyone to say that uh, this has been a, a very worthwhile and enjoyable um, past uh, 48 hours uh, here, in, here in Washington. So now, our final task is to ask, um, what is the next assignment? Where do we next uh, take the research of the history of NACA, NASA, and aerospace uh, development in general? Um, our last panel is here to offer some thoughts on the question of, uh, to and to stimulate some discussion on uh, further themes uh, in aerospace research and what further questions uh, we wish to, to pursue. Uh, we originally had four uh, presenters on our panel, but uh, one, uh, Michael Gorn, a longtime uh, NASA and U.S. Air Force historian, uh, unfortunately wasn't able to, uh, to join us because of a family emergency out of the country. Uh, but Mike did uh, uh, share a few thoughts with me and asked that I um, relay them to you uh, this afternoon. So I'll, I'll do that before we uh, get to our formal presentations uh, who are with us this afternoon. Um, in addressing uh, what lessons uh, we have to derive from the NACA, NACA years, uh, Mike had two in particular that he wanted to talk about. Uh, the first was uh, research freedom, uh, and uh, uh, using Mike's uh, words, uh, scientists and engineers pursued their research with a freedom to investigate promising phenomena that arose unexpectedly from unrelated inquiries. A long-serving Ames Research Center engineer and administrator named Jack Boyd recalled the NACA's research atmosphere, and I'm quoting uh, Jack Boyd here. The spirit at Ames in the days of the NACA was one of freedom and innovation. No reasonable idea was discouraged, and there was a freedom to learn. Continuous learning, even when done unconventionally, kept curiosity strong, and curiosity led to innovation. I felt intimidated when I started in 1947 as an engineer right out of college, but everyone encouraged me. If you had an idea and it had relevance to anything at all, they let you pursue it as far as you wanted to. It was a very open-minded society in those days. Uh, so that quote uh, Mike offers to uh, uh, give a sense of uh, what he characterizes as the research freedom in, in the heyday of the NACA years. The other aspect uh, that um, Mike points to is the um, in-house talent and capabilities of NACA. And we've heard a lot about um, uh, the, the, the evolution of the NACA model and how that uh, changed uh, into the transition into the NASA years. And uh, Mike speaks to the, uh, the in-house talent and capabilities in the early days. Uh, again, uh, Mike's words, uh, on-staff craftsmen, craftsmen gave the NAC the flexibility to select which projects to contract out and which to pursue as part of a program of in-house research. The value of this in-house capability uh, is exemplified, with some exaggeration, by an exchange around 1960 between Milt Thompson, one of NASA's preeminent pilots, and Jerry, and Jerry Reedy, a technician who collaborated with Thompson at the Dryden, now Armstrong Flight Research Center. Reedy said that he was, quote, approached by Thompson and asked, hey, Jerry, can you make one of these? Referring to a picture of a lawn chair with three little wheels on it, like a triangle uh, with wheels on it. It had a power wing on top, and a tilt stick coming down to steer it with. Reedy, Reedy laughed and said, yes, we can build one. And then he said to Milt, well, to Milt, well, but I don't want to build that out of a lawn chair. From this rough concept came the paraglider research vehicle, or the Paraseb, built at Dryden and, and flight tested by Thompson, Neil Armstrong, and others to explore the feasibility of space capsule touchdowns on land rather than sea. So those are a couple of examples that Mike offers about the character of the research environment uh, at NACA. Uh, Mike also wanted to ask us to consider a couple of questions with regard to the shortcomings of the NACA legacy and what those might mean. In particular, again, Mike's words, uh, 
the absence of minority employees at NACA, uh, in, in particular the absence of minority employees at NACA. Did minority policies and practices evolve at the NACA's 43 years, keeping step with changes in American society? Simply poses that, poses that question. Uh, he also uh, references the absence of significant female participation in, technical, in the technical legacy of NACA. Did policies and practices change from 1915 to 1958 to open opportunities to more female scientists and engineers? So he suggests that those are a couple of areas where we might look at some of the shortcomings of the NACA legacy and what that might mean. Finally, uh, Mike uh, wanted us to consider and, and actually make a call uh, to pr better preserve and organize the records of the NACA. Uh, NACA, NACA archives are scattered across field centers, federal record centers, NASA headquarters, historical archive, and other places. It seems reasonable at 100 years, NACA's record should be preserved consciously, preferably in one place. This may be achieved by collecting all the documents at field centers and transferring them to NASA headquarters, where the fine headquarters staff of archivists may assemble and the pieces into a coherent whole. This simple transfer might be augmented by repatriating uh, by copying NAC re NACA records hidden in other federal record centers, the National Archives proper, presidential libraries, and other institutions. Much as the Lincoln Presidential Library sends researchers to institutions to reclaim Lincoln documents from far and wide. But if the actual documents pose too much of a space and storage problem, perhaps a team could be assembled to visit over a well-defined period of time every NASA center and digitize and all NASA-related records on site. Perhaps field offices could be persuaded to contribute resources to the project. Eventually, the project might be expanded to federal record centers and some other archival institutions bearing NACA documents. Uh, I think the last one is a, certainly a, a noble cause that we all agree should happen, uh, but of course resources would be, be a big issue. But um, certainly uh, looking back at 100 years, uh, being cognizant of the importance of the NACA archive, and I think this conference has certainly demonstrated that uh, is an important one for all scholars and, and archivists and, and uh, institutions which hold these records to, to thoughtfully consider. So those were a few thoughts that Mike uh, Gorn wanted to share with us, uh, and I was pleased to be able to uh, share those with you. Um, now to our uh, panelists who are with us in the flesh here. Um, we're going to begin with uh, uh, Janet Bednarik. Uh, Dr. Bednarik is a professor of history at the University of Dayton, where she teaches classes in American urban history and the history of technology. She is the author of a number of books, including America's Airports, Airfield Development, 1918 to 1947, and Dreams of Flight, General Aviation in the United States. Uh, she's currently working on a book manuscript examining the history of U.S. airports since 1945. Janet? Well, when Roger uh, asked me to be a part of this, um, he said, well, this panel is going to be called The Next Assignment. And uh, when you say that to a college professor, um, the first thing you think about, of course, are paper assignments. So I kind of approach this as um, if I were to be talking to some of my students about research papers that they might do um, in this general area. And a, a lot of the things that I came up with uh, don't necessarily have the NACA or NASA as their central focus, but I think that if students were to look at these uh, topics that uh, including the NACA and NASA in their, in their research, in the research strategy, I think would be um, very, very valuable. Um, I teach a lot of engineering students, a lot of engineering students, and uh, one of the reasons I teach a lot of engineering students is that um, at the University of Dayton anyway, and a lot of other places, we believe that we need to train engineers more broadly, uh, that they need to be, to be trained not just in their technical fields, but also in um, the arts and in the humanities and in, and in business and, and so on. So um, if I were to talk to one of my students about um, research, I think that looking at the history of interdisciplinary research um, in engineering, in science and technology, I think would be um, a very uh, important topic. Um, 
And not just interdisciplinary in, in terms of a mechanical engineer working with an electrical engineer and so on, um, but um, across broader disciplines, uh, engineering and the social sciences. Um, but also, if you bring the NACA into it in particular, they were saying um, the NACA didn't do anything unless another government agency asked them to do it, if, if the military asked them to do it, or uh, the post office asked them to do it, or, or something like that. So um, I think that um, more history looking at um, interdisciplinary research, interagency research, having to do with the history of uh, technology, the advance of aerospace in this country, um, I think that would be a very fruitful area for uh, future research. Um, a little closer to my own heart, um, I would like to see more uh, research on ground facilities, um, airports in particular. Um, yesterday, um, while I was listening to some of the papers, um, I was really very happy um, to, with the paper on Octave Chanute. Um, when, I, when I've taught the history of aviation, uh, we, we've talked about some of the early pioneers, and yes, they wanted to get uh, something up into the air. Uh, some of them weren't too terribly concerned about control. Uh, others, uh, you know, they just wanted to make something fly. Um, and one thing that a lot of them had in common was they, they, they were really interested in getting the airplane up in the air. They weren't necessarily that concerned about what would happen when it stopped flying. Um, so I was really happy to see that Octave Chanute on his list of things to do included landing. Um, it was number 10 on his list, um, but I think it does say something that it was a civil engineer who thought about landing his uh, aircraft. Um, and as a quote out on one of the walls there say, uh, from Clement Keyes, nine-tenths of, nine of aviation is on the ground. Well, when I uh, was doing some of my early airport research, um, I thought, well, there's, there's got to be some studies about how airports should be built and where they should be built and, and what kind of facilities they ought to have. So I went to NACA technical papers to see, certainly somebody asked them and no one did because there, there was no work that was done on that. Um, I guess the post office didn't ask them. Um, maybe no one at uh, the NACA thought about it because it occurred to me the other day when somebody else was presenting that airports don't fit in wind tunnels, um, so it wouldn't have been of interest to them. Um, but um, tangentially, the NACA and NASA have had, um, uh, have done important research for, for airports, and in particular, um, in the post-war period, during the 50s and into the 1960s, aircraft noise uh, was a major challenge to aviation in this country and particularly to local efforts to build airports for the burgeoning commercial uh, aviation sector. And uh, the NACA and then NASA, uh, together with the FAA, did a lot of important research on, on aircraft noise. Um, and I think that that is a story that has not fully been told um, about how to make aircraft less noisy or how to operate them uh, less noisily. Um, so that would be an interesting topic, I think, for students to uh, research. Um, I was talking to um, uh, a NASA researcher, I think he's at, yeah, NASA Ames, and he's working on air traffic control uh, and how NASA is working to increase the efficiency so airports can have more airport, more planes land, more planes take off more efficiently. You do that, you're going to cause problems um, on the ground. Uh, so again, getting back to my um, topic about interdisciplinary, um, I think it, for the future, I'm just going to cut in on future just a second. I think it'd be really interesting if NASA would talk to some urban planners about this. But nonetheless, I think that um, some of the research that uh, the NACA started in the 50s and NASA did in the 60s on aircraft noise uh, would be an interesting topic for a student to take up. Um, of course, timely topics are always important. Um, I have a former student who's working on a PhD at Boston College now 
Um, and he started his research project three or four years ago. Uh, and he's actually in the history of medicine, but his topic is marijuana. Uh, and it's about how marijuana went from being a medical substance to an illegal drug kind of thing. And I'm thinking, wow, what a great topic. Um, so I think a topic, though, that would fit with this for NACA and NASA is sustainability. Um, NACA and NASA were often very interested in efficiency. Well, efficiency and sustainability are two very different things, although sometimes they get used interchangeably. Um, you assume that if it's efficient, if you're using a resource efficiently, that it is also sustainable. But um, sustainability is, is much more complex. So I think a very interesting topic might be to go back and look at um, the evolution of this notion of efficiency into sustainability in the aircraft industry, uh, because it, it is going to be a, a crucial topic with um, the debates over climate change and uh, exhaust from aircraft and uh, you know, aviation is not considered to be terribly green, um, but to look at, at kind of the evolution and, and movement from simply wanting to build very efficient aircraft to building more sustainable or environmentally friendly aircraft. Um, another area I think that we can find a longer history in um, that both the NACA and NASA were part of is the history of general aviation in the United States. Um, again, yesterday, uh, some folks were talking about, again, the entrepreneurial spirit at, at NACA. Um, they may not have done anything particularly with personal flying or general aviation as part of their formal program, but certainly Fred uh, Weick was very interested in general aviation, uh, came up with the air coupe uh, while working at the NACA during the 1930s. Um, so to go forward with that, and then with NASA and the small aircraft transport system and so on, I, I think it'd be very interesting to, to look at the, uh, at the contributions of the NACA and NASA to um, general aviation, to general aviation safety, to, to aircraft uh, and the like. Um, finally, um, a very broad topic is, is access. Um, Aviation is a technology um, access to which has been uh, governed by, at different times, by gender, uh, by race, by class. Um, I don't think that either the NACA or NASA um, has tackled the um, issue of access directly, but indirectly, I think if you were looking at um, the access to this technology, certainly uh, in the 20s and 30s, um, making aircraft safer, um, making aircraft more efficient and hence less expensive to operate, certainly address the issues of fear and fare um, that uh, blocked access, um, and um, again, kind of getting to the, the GA side of it, um, I'm concerned about uh, access in tertiary markets in the United States. As um, post deregulation, um, the, the market is now, or, or the aircraft um, route structure is now shaped by the market rather than by the public good uh, as it was under the CAB. Um, there are parts of this country, perhaps aptly named the Great Flyover. Um, that may indeed be flown over uh, because there, there simply isn't uh, enough traffic generated out there to interest the commercial airlines. Um, the subsidies that Congress has been given to uh, continue to have service at places like Hastings, Nebraska, and uh, Fargo, North Dakota, and a few places like that, um, I think it's a question of not uh, if but when those subsidies are going to be closed. Um, so um, I, I think this whole issue of access, access to aviation, um, access to this technology, um, what has 
the NA, what did the NACA do? What did NASA do over time uh, to make this um, technology more accessible to people regardless of their gender, regardless of their race, regardless of their class, maybe now regardless of where they live in the United States, uh, would be a very interesting topic, I think, for students to, um, to investigate. Uh, very broad ideas. Um, these would be things I'd throw out to students. Um, hopefully, in, in talking with them uh, or talking with you this afternoon, we can refine these a little bit more. But um, again, they may not have the NHCA and uh, NASA as their, their central focus. But certainly, if you're looking at the topics of interdisciplinary research, ground facility, sustainability, general aviation, or access, adding the NACA and NASA to the mix, I think will give you a richer story in the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, our next, next uh, uh, panelist uh, is Peter Westwick, uh, who is uh, Assistant Research Professor in History at USC and the Director of, Aer of the Aerospace History Project at the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West. Uh, he is author of Into the Black, JPL, and the Aerospace Program, 1976-2004, and the National Labs, Science in, the, in an American System, 1947-1974, and the editor of Blue Sky Metropolis, the Aerospace Century in Southern California. And unrelated, but uh, no doubt especially fascinating, he is also the co-author uh, with Peter uh, Neuschel of The World in the Curl, An Unconventional History of Surfing. I think uh, um, the weather outside is probably not attuned to surfing today, but uh, no doubt that uh, would be a wonderful subject for, for another, another conference. Uh, but today, uh, Peter is going to uh, share a little, bit, a little bit with us about the post-World uh, War II changes in the institutional landscape that affected NACA and NASA. Peter? Thank you, Peter, and I'd like to second the uh, thanks to our organizers. Um, and the previous panelists. Um, and believe it or not, there are actually intriguing connections between surfing and aerospace, which is how I kind of got into that subject. Uh, but another talk. Uh, let me confess, confess up front to an anachronism. I'm going to be saying NACA, NACA even when I'm talking about the NASA years, just so I'm not trying to jump back and forth uh, when I'm referring to NACA's primary interest in flight. And of course, my thing has just gone to sleep here. Uh, and also, uh, I wrote these comments last night uh, after yesterday's panels, and today's discussions have brought up uh, several of the issues which I'll raise here, but hopefully I can elaborate them and maybe uh, spark some discussion. So many of us here uh, probably know the sensation of working through the papers of aeronautical engineers from the 30s, uh, 40s, and 50s. Uh, for such collections, uh, people like Kelly Johnson, for instance, odds are that you'll find several files full of those famous NACA and NACA technical reports. Is that still the case? Do engineers at Lockheed or Boeing or Wright Pat uh, still closely follow the NACA's aeronautical research? Uh, does the fact that few of our papers here uh, dealt with the last 40 years mean that the NACA has lost its importance? Uh, perhaps we should not be surprised. Uh, here we have an institution created in the context of World War I at a time when most people traveled by horse or railroad or steamship and when military planners thought that airplanes might be useful but hadn't really figured out how yet. Uh, thanks in part to the NACA, we live in a far different world today. Is today's NACA like a vestigial limb, an appendage left over from a bygone era? If the NACA didn't exist today, would we want to create it? And going back to Roger's introductory talk, uh, that most fundamental question, was Newt Gingrich right? When the NACA came on the scene, it had little competition. Soon, though, universities developed an aero engineering faculty and facilities such as Galsit at Caltech with its 10-foot wind tunnel. After World War II, the military expanded its own R&D capabilities. Uh, the Air Force, just uh, one service, had laboratories for flight dynamics, avionics, and propulsion at wright Pat, among other places. It had its own science advisor and its own science advisory committee and its own dedicated think tank at RAND. Uh, the Cold War also vastly expanded the security and classification regime uh, sealing off many military programs, as uh, Bill's question earlier uh, indicated. Aircraft firms, meanwhile, developed in-house R&D capability, materials labs, anechoic chambers, eventually supercomputers and hydrocodes, and so on. So what remained of the NACA's role? Amid this evolving institutional ecology for American aviation, how did the NACA adapt? 
Consider two of the major developments in military aircraft in the last 40 years, stealth and uh, UAVs or RPVs, drones, whatever you want to call them. What role did the NACA play? Stealth was an ARPA initiative and drew largely on in-house R&D at Lockheed and Northrop. Uh, it did rely on fly-by-wire, but the F-117 at least uh, used analog Air Force avionics and not the digital NASA version. There was, however, an NACA contribution on the B-2. A Northrop designer supposedly got the B-2's distinctive hawkbill airfoil from the old NACA airfoil catalog. Similarly for UAVs, uh, the Amber drone, the forerunner of the Predator, uh, was a DARPA initiative, as I understand it. Uh, but NASA had done relevant work on flight controls, flight simulation, and uh, Dryden, uh, I gather, worked with General Atomics to develop the subsequent Reaper uh, drone. Now, these examples are based on uh, anecdotal evidence, and that leads to my point. Uh, the job of this panel, as I understand it, is to consider the question, what next? Uh, that can mean what's next for uh, NACA, but also what's next for historians. Uh, and for historians, what's next should be to move our gaze forward in time to more recent cases like the ones I just mentioned. The talks here demonstrated that there is still fruitful ground to cover uh, in the 20s and 30s on top of the existing excellent histories of Alex Rowland, Jim Hansen, and others. We know far less, however, about the last 40 or so years. Thanks to the center histories, we know something about the institutions, but we have much to learn about the technologies, the disciplines, and especially the people of NACA or NASA. And that should include, as Glenn Bugo suggested, not just the research engineers, but also, for instance, the shop people and other sorts. This historiographical gap does not necessarily imply a decline in NASA's uh, or NACA's import. Historians, of course, get skittish about more recent events for which we lack both archival sources and perspective. But we also seem to have blinded, been blinded by the space age. Historians have fluttered away from airplanes to the space race like moths to a flame. In this, we reflected public interest, which admittedly is often a useful guide to research topics. The NACA may have been relatively invisible uh, in the 20s and 30s, but flight was certainly not. The romantic, heroic image of early aviation captured the public Im imagination and with it the attention of historians. After Sputnik, space became the new fixation. At just the time, as it happened, that commercial air travel was becoming routine and accessible uh, to many Americans, though not all Americans. Of course, the NACA is not the only entity to attract more attention for its youth than its more mature years. Uh, consider the history of nuclear weapons or the other national labs. What I think of when we talk about national labs is not NACA, but uh, the ones coming out of the Manhattan Project. There are dozens of histories of wartime Los Alamos uh, and far fewer on later programs or the labs under the DOE. Uh, the same goes for NASA's space program, to judge by the countless histories of the space race, the Apollo era, uh, compared to histories of the last couple decades. Uh, and by the way, those, the DOE national labs uh, also display uh, those characteristics of competition, specialization, diversification, uh, which the NACA centers also, uh, or NASA centers, uh, also exhibit uh, in different forms. Some interesting comparisons to be drawn there. The upshot is that one comes away with a vague, lingering sense of the 20s and 30s as the golden age of NACA, the time when the NACA worked right. Talking about golden ages, however, tarnishes what comes after. And one of the usual jobs of historians is to complicate the standard stories, to show that the glory days were not necessarily so great as they were later remembered, and to show that non-golden ages uh, provide important developments. Of course, historians aim not only to complicate our view of history, uh, but also to impose some generalizations, or at least suggest generalizations, including periodization. Uh, and here Robert Ferguson has provided some uh, provocative starting point. But what sort of periodization uh, can the history of NACA add to our view of NASA and more generally to our view of the last centuries? So if the 20s and 30s uh, were the golden age, in quotes, uh, then the post-war years from 1945 to Sputnik were either what uh, Deborah Douglas has called uh, the second golden age, or, uh, as uh, Jim's question earlier was asking, you know, is it another golden age or was it uh, a dark age at a time of trouble? Or we could call it instead the silver age after those shimmering aircraft streaking above the skies above the Mojave. Uh, after Sputnik, of course, came the space age, uh, which drew on NACA work, as Robert and Glenn, among others, have pointed out, but also, I think, brought a turning point. As the NACA was swallowed by NASA, uh, uh, the NACA centers jumped on the space bandwagon. Uh, lunar landers and biking at Langley, pioneers at Ames, uh, solar electric propulsion at Lewis, uh, and so on. 
In the 1970s, uh, as Robert suggested, NACA entered a new period. Call it the Silicon Age. Computational models supplanted wind tunnels, the old NACA mainstay, but perhaps more importantly, avionics eclipsed aeronautics in aircraft design. Electrical engineers elbowed aside aeronautical engineers, or as they say, the cone heads took over from the tin benders. This was, I think, a fundamental turning point for the NACA, which after all was the National Committee for Aeronautics. And as John Anderson reminded us this morning, the NACA was all about aeronautical engineering. Now, aerodynamics did not go away, but the aeronautical engineer no longer held the same sway. And we can see signs of this beyond the NACA. Uh, Caltech Galset lost its old von Karmanian cachet, and Caltech, believe it or not, no longer offers an aero engineering major. So what did this mean, this disciplinary transition? What did this mean for the NACA? The end of the Cold War added another inflection point, as it greatly reduced, at least for a decade, the influence of national security, the NACA's initial driver. Aviation research fought a losing battle for funding, leading perhaps to a jaundiced view of this period. And one is tempted, talking to people at the centers today, to call this perhaps the age of dysfunction. Because we had, meanwhile, the growth of the regulatory and administrative state. The proliferation of new laws, OSHA, ITAR, audits, and so on, were unknown in the early days, but are all too familiar today, and help explain why the earlier period might now look like a golden age, and why the NACA could not remain purely a technocratic organization. And this, too, is not unique to NASA. Or, perhaps, could we see this uh, as the era of globalization? I was struck in the talks here by the constant references for the early years to connections with Europe, and recall that Theodorsen left the NACA after World War II to help Brazil build up its aviation capability. I'd be curious to learn whether such connections have increased in our increasingly interconnected world, or whether developments such as ITAR, or for that matter, uh, other commercial and military interests associated with aviation uh, have decreased such connections. And what of today? Is this, after all, a rise and fall narrative? Is the NACA obsolete? The federal government, of course, is better at creating institutions than at closing them. And again, I'd point to the DOE National Labs, whose original technology, most particularly nuclear weapons, also nuclear reactors, have become mature and greatly curtailed for research purposes through various trees. Uh, but the National Labs have adapted and have survived repeated calls to close them uh, over, the, uh, over the decades. For the NACA, if universities are retreating from aero engineering and aircraft firms are similarly scaling back their R&D commitments, perhaps there is a need for a revived federal role and a rejuvenated NACA. If so, perhaps it would be presumptuous to call this the Renaissance. But perhaps we could say instead that a reformation is at hand. And our next speaker, bearing the appropriate initials ML, will nail some theses to our church door. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our final performance um, will be Mark Lewis, uh, who will be playing the role of the ghost of aerospace future. And uh, he will be discussing uh, what boundaries we still are pushing and uh, taking a look at uh, what advances and what limitations we might see in current and future aerospace uh, research and development. Uh, Dr. Lewis is director of the Institute for Defense Analyses, Science and Technology Policy Institute, a federally funded research development center. Um, he leads a team of researchers providing analysis of national and international science and technology issues for the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Science Foundation. Uh, Dr. Lewis uh, uh, has served as the Willis Young Jr. Professor and Chair of the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Maryland and uh, was the Chief Science Scientist for the U.S. Air Force from uh, 2004 to 2008. Dr. Lewis? Well, it's always, it's always a challenge being the last speaker on the last panel of the last day of the symposium. On the other hand, I have the privilege of being the non-historian so I can pontificate about the future. And if I'm wrong at the 200th anniversary of the NACA, I probably won't be around to find out about it. So no one will be able to complain to me about it. Um, I did want to say that you know I, I consider it a privilege to be asked to, to be on this panel 
because in many ways I would argue the legacy of the NACA, the, the thing that we really should be celebrating, uh, in addition to all the many contributions that came out of the NACA, is the sense and the spirit and the focus on the future. An organization that was looking to the future, looking to new technology, and I think that's an important element to capture because I think that spirit still exists. Um, there are those who will tell us that aviation is a mature industry. I, I hear that often. I, I have people ask me, you know, is building airplanes like building, is it like a buggy, uh, horse and buggy whip uh, uh, industry? Um, I think it's really very important that we make the case that no, we're not in a sunset industry. Uh, aviation, aeronautics is not a mature discipline yet. We've solved many problems. Clearly, just looking around this museum, we've solved many, many issues, many technology challenges. Um, but there are many of those challenges, many important problems left to solve. In many ways, I'd argue we've solved the simple problems. We've, we've grabbed some of the low-hanging fruit, maybe the, some of the higher-hanging fruit, but, but some of the really difficult issues still remain to be solved. Um, a few years back, uh, I think it was in this gallery in the Air and Space Museum, you could actually see the Navier-Stokes equations, the governing equations that describe fluid motion over an airfoil, over a wing, over a body. It was great to have that in a museum. Um, and those are equations that were actually derived in the 1820s and developed through the 1830s. 18, not 19, so they're, they're, they're almost 200 years old. And yet, to this day, we still don't know how to solve those equations. We have approximations, we have simplifications, we have tools, we have methodologies. We get better and better at it every year, most recently because of the advent of computers, computational solutions. But yet, there's still plenty of room to go. There are plenty of challenges that, that, that we have, and I think we need to keep that, that focus in mind. Um, among the list of things we don't know, I could, I, could, I could go on for most of the panel just describing the problems that remain. Some of them are very fundamental. Some of them are very basic. For example, when the boundary layer flow near the surface of a vehicle transitions from lambda to turbulent, we don't know when that occurs in all cases. We don't understand all the physics associated with it. And that's especially true as we go higher and higher up the Mach scale. Uh, very recently, we have some examples of some flight test vehicles that were lost because of our lack of understanding of boundary layer transition at high speed. So that's just one example. I'd also point out that we live in an amazing era where we have better tools, not just the computational tools that I mentioned. Think of the advance of materials. Think of how material science has changed and is still changing our aerospace industry. Last week, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, the Sikorsky helicopter plant down in West Palm Beach. It was especially a pleasure because it was West Palm Beach, so it was 80 degrees, well, you know, which I, I, I heard a lot about that from my wife, that I was in West Palm Beach while DC was being snowed in. But one of the things I got to tour, tour through was their, their development facility where they're producing, they're experimenting with the next generation of hybrid rotorcraft systems. Helicopters that build on uh, Sikorsky's X2 vehicle, which combined a lifting rotor with a propel, propelling uh, uh, rear propulsor. And this is a capability and a technology which would not have been possible just a few years ago because it depends on modern materials, in this case, advanced composite materials, which are ultra stiff, and also modern control technologies, and also the electronics, the hardware, that will drive that control technology. Um, similarly, I mentioned our ability to solve the Navier-Stokes equations with computers. We can do computational solutions now that are absolutely eye-watering. Uh, we've got computers today that are incredibly, incredibly powerful and allow us to predict flows and predict flow fields in ways that we couldn't have even dreamed of just 10 years ago. There are some very clear trends, therefore, that are coming out of this. One, as I think was mentioned, UAVs, and also the whole, the whole element of controllability but also autonomy. Uh, it's led to some interesting philosophical discussions, how much autonomy should be on a vehicle. It's led to some important discussions within military circles. But the fact remains that we're seeing a revolution in our ability to control small, un un unmanned, uncrewed systems. Um, and that's driven in part not only by the aerodynamics but, and the control, but also the, the microelectronics revolution. Um, that has come with it a, a revolution in size. We're seeing smaller and smaller uh, but capable flight systems. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we had a small UAV fly over the gates of the White House that reminded us some of the challenges that that technology will pose. Efficiency. Uh, one, of my, one of my colleagues on the panel mentioned uh, the importance of, of efficiency, ever more efficient aircraft. Um, one of the problems there is that aerospace systems are among the most efficient machines ever developed on our planet. A modern gas turbine engine is more efficient in terms of the energy that comes out compared to the energy that goes in from the fuel than almost any other machine I can think of. And yet we're seeing some amazing concepts some dramatic increases in that propulsion efficiency and the overall efficiency of the flight vehicle. 
And I like to point out, when all is said and done, aerospace engineering is really about energy conversion. We're a field where we figure out how to take energy, often in the form of fermented dinosaurs, and convert it into useful kinetic energy for transportation. Those are concepts and technologies that apply well beyond aerospace engineering. For example, we're seeing very efficient modern power plants that are using aviation technology, jet engine technology, to achieve their high efficiencies. New propulsion. We're seeing concepts in propulsion, some of which have been, have been talked about for decades, but are only now coming, in, um, coming into to play, only now being realized. My very favorite example is, is actually represented by some of the vehicles that are on the wall of this gallery. And the folks watching this at home won't be able to see, but we've got some, some uh, examples of hypersonic vehicles, high-speed vehicles. Um, in the late 1950s, uh, uh, researchers at the NACA proposed the idea of air-breathing propulsion systems that could fly at hypersonic speeds, speeds many times the speed of sound. In May of 2013, the United States Air Force finally demonstrated a practical vehicle using those concepts with its X-51 flight vehicle. And so that's just the beginning of a revolution in speed that we saw started by NACA, but now enabled, in many cases, again, by modern technology, modern capabilities, computational capabilities, advanced, uh, advanced materials, and also the work of decades of research and, and blood, sweat, and tears. Now, I would say if we look at the overall uh, a picture in, in aeronautics today, building on the NACA legacy, uh, there's a glass half full story. There's also, frankly, a, a glass half empty story. The NASA aeronautics budget, as those of us who love aviation, who love airplanes, are, are, are quick to point out, is a tiny percentage of the overall NASA budget hovering recently around 3% of the overall NASA budget. It's gone up a little bit. The latest appropriations numbers uh, have that increasing. But still, about half of where the budget was for, for aeronautics uh, about a decade ago in NASA. And, and that's obviously a concern. But i also point out there are other organizations within the US government that sponsor aviation research. The Air Force Research Lab, for example, has a $4 billion a year budget. And much of that goes into the things that, that were envisioned in, in the NACA. DARPA, as well, invests significant uh, uh, resources into aerospace. The glass half empty side, uh, we see an expanded pace of development. Right? There was a time when an aerospace engineer could look forward to a career which would involve the design and development of many, many aircraft. Kelly Johnson, I think, was involved in the design of 47 different aircraft in his career. Today, an aerospace engineering graduate will be lucky if he or she is involved in the design of a single vehicle. That's the glass half empty. But the glass half full sight is there are still organizations, there are still companies, there are still government labs where that development is underway. Aurora Flight Sciences comes to mind. Uh, my friends at Aurora have been, develop have, been, have been involved in a very, very long list of, of vehicle developments, and, and that's ongoing. So we haven't quite lost that yet. Glass half empty, we see some loss of US leadership. Uh, there was a time when, if you got any commercial airliner, it was built by an American company. Today, if you get on a, on a commercial airliner, you got about a 50-50 chance that it was built by an American company. We've seen inroads in the small aviation uh, business. Embraer, for example, in Brazil, is building some amazing airplanes, and they've captured a significant portion of the, of the market. So we do have some, some, some uh, uh, worries, uh, especially given that aviation is such a large portion of our manufactured exports to the United States. But let me, if I may, close with what I think is probably the most significant glass half full. By the way, you know, the engineer doesn't debate whether the glass is half empty or half full. The, the engineer just observes the glass was over-designed. But with that in mind, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stick with the glass half full, and I'll tell you what I think is the best news. Um, some of my panel, panel mates talked about aviation, and, and, and mention was made of, of Caltech, for example, rolling back its aviation, its, its aerospace program. But the reality is, today, aerospace continues to be an extraordinarily attractive field for future engineers. Um, when I was at the University of Maryland, the biggest problem that we had was our classrooms were overcrowded. We had more applicants that we, than we knew what to do with. And in fact, most of the aerospace programs in the country today will tell you the same thing, that they have a flood of applicants. And by the way, you will often hear the faculty members, especially the older ones, the ones in, in, in my age category, complain that kids today just aren't as smart as they used to be. That's nonsense. The students coming in today are as smart as ever. They come in with more tools than we ever had in our generation. They're more capable. Uh, they're more prepared. Uh, just one example, when I started as a faculty member at the University of Maryland, we always assumed that students coming in had to be taught calculus. Um, when, when, I, when I left the university um, um, just a few years ago, 
Uh, it was a given that any student coming into engineering had to have calculus. If they didn't, they were automatically behind, essentially behind in the program. And that, I think, shows an important evolution in, in our expectations driven by capabilities. So if I can close, I'd say we've got, frankly, a very rosy future if we manage that future correctly. We've got a, a blossoming workforce. We have students today who are fascinated by aviation. They're still captivated by the magic of flight, just as those, those NACA engineers were 100 years ago, 50 years ago. That cohort is there. I submit to you that our challenge is to make sure that they have the projects to work on, that they have the exciting efforts that they can contribute their blood, sweat, and tears, their intellectual energy, to keep them motivated so we can be talking about this discipline into the next century. Thank you. And uh, also to, to Peter and Janet, we had some very stimulating thoughts in, the, in those brief remarks. Uh, as this uh, final session is structured as a panel discussion and we have plenty of time, uh, I think I'll be begin before taking uh, comments from the, from the questions from the audience is to let our uh, panelists interact a little bit here and uh, give each of them an opportunity to, to reflect on uh, what they've heard their fellow panelists uh, talk about. So Janet, uh, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I'm glad somebody brought up um, unmanned aerial vehicles, because um, I, I think those are uh, really going to be a, a big part of our future. I'm not sure they have enough history for me to assign as a, a paper yet for my students, but they certainly will be. Um, and again, um, I think it also uh, gets to interdisciplinary and interagency, uh, because it, it's not just the technological capabilities of these, but it brings up uh, the issues of privacy um, but, and the philosophy of man-machine interface. Um, how, how autonomous do we really want these things to be? Uh, how deep into the aviation culture do we want the remotely piloted um, paradigm to go? I'm, I'm not sure anyone of my generation or even the students that I'm teaching today would be really happy getting on an airplane where no one was in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you're talking about efficiency, that might be the future. So um, I, I, I think that th th that's another area I think we're going to be talking about a lot over the next uh, decades is uh, um, the whole unmanned uh, aerial vehicle uh, revolution. Peter? Yeah, I think both uh, Janet and Mark brought up an interesting point, which hasn't really come up. Uh, it's been implicit in, I think, a lot of talks here, but that is um, engineering pedagogy and the interplay between um, university curricula, or for that matter, uh, you know, lower uh, school curricula, and uh, the NACA and the demands of both commercial and military aviation. And um, so I think there's some interesting stuff to be done there. Um, and my uh, account of Caltech is just anecdotal, but I was teaching there uh, last year, and I had students who were very interested in, um, in aerospace and were actually kind of frustrated that there was no, they didn't have the major, you can minor in it, but you're still a structural engineering uh, right. major. Right. Um, but I think Mark's uh, comments also kind of reinforce the point that there's a lot that we don't know about what's been going on in the last decade or couple of decades. Um, and that we historians, I think, uh, there's a lot of work, which is a good thing for historians, that there's a lot of work still to be done, uh, job secured, I guess, in a sense. But there's a lot that we don't know um, leading up to the, uh, the current state. And um, we need to hopefully get access to sources and get out there and start writing those histories. Okay. Right. Further thoughts? Sure. So, so uh, I pick up on your, your comments about UAVs. I, I think you're, you're exactly right that there are some wonderful questions about the intersection of technology and policy. Um, I actually used to ask all my students if they'd be willing to get on an airplane that didn't have a pilot on board. Mm -hmm. And of course, they all say no. And then you point out, well, you know, you actually do ride on, if you ever go to the Atlanta airport, you're riding on a subway system that doesn't have a driver. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, the, uh, the most common cause of airplane accidents is, is pilot mm -hmm. error. Now, we all know that part of that is because often the pilot isn't around to defend themselves mm -hmm. afterwards. <laughs> we hear, but, yeah. but, um, but so there's an interesting debate. And, and, and if you actually look, you look at a modern jetliner, I mean, especially an Airbus aircraft today, what yeah. does the pilot actually have to do? Mm -hmm. Not an awful lot. 
Um, interesting. If something goes wrong. Well, so th there's a something goes wrong. So I'll give you an interesting tidbit, and, and here I'm going to provoke a little bit of controversy. Um, a, a friend and colleague at the University of Michigan looked at the famous case, Sullenberg's Landing right. in the river, and, and that's, been ex that's been put forward as an example of you know, the pilot jumping in and saving the aircraft. She's examined it and actually figured out that there was enough energy in that aircraft to make it back to an airport. And if there had been an onboard, a, a, a modern digital control system, it wouldn't have had to have landed in the river. It could have actually landed at an airport. So, so that's actually, it's the example that's given, it's actually the counterexample. But that's one anecdote. Um, you know, if I, if I can, uh, if I can address the the the, the uh, uh, your point about about, uh, about retaining history, one of the things that I really appreciated working with the Air Force was the Air Force had this very strong sense that history is is a living organism, and and whenever there was an important event occurring, whenever there was an important decision being made, we always had the historian in the room recording what was happening. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess I would put the plug in, I think that's, that's a really important role for the historian. Um, I also like to point out that it's, it's really good to befriend historians because they always have the last word. So, you know, for what, <laughs> for what I, whatever I can do for historians, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm eager to do that. As a former employee of the Air Force History Program, mm -hmm. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. I would like to throw in one more comment, which is actually a response to Mike Gorin's uh, mailed in comments, though, about uh, the need for uh, NASA history to do what he says maybe a better job of collecting and kind of. Um, maybe centralizing or somehow collecting stuff that's scattered among various centers and stuff. Um, let me tell you, as somebody who's spent some time working in, uh, with DOE archives, uh, NASA is light years ahead of the DOE when it comes to history. I um, mean, the history office here, you know, we, uh, a lot of us here have worked with the history office. It is um, indispensable for us historians, and just we are all uh, in extreme debt to uh, the NASA historians, uh, the archivists and the people who work there, and the institution to back uh, the history office uh, with the resource to do the job. So uh, yes, we can ask for more. Uh, yeah, it would be great to have more, but on the other hand, uh, go work with some other agencies and then uh, come back and talk to us. Well, I think Mike is just kind of offering a, a, a cautionary tale as, as uh, time right. moves forward, yeah. um, uh, we tend to, uh, institutions often tend to not be particularly concerned about their history, forget about their history, and uh, uh, it's always uh, important for us to be mindful that uh, those records uh, uh, are always to be mined, uh, whether they've been looked at once or a hundred times, um, there's always, uh, always fresh insights to be uh, yeah. to gathered, and uh, of course, uh, every historian always uh, likes to make their best friends archivists and librarians, yeah, right. because uh, mm -hmm. Without those fine <laughs> souls, uh, uh, we wouldn't have an awful lot that uh, we could we could find on our own. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a good uh, cautionary tale about uh, archives in general. Mm -hmm. uh, unless we have any further discussion so, among the so group I, here, if if I if I can jump in on that mm -hmm. one, yep. I'll tell you another reason why I think it's so important, and and it's it's a point that I like to make often that when we make investments in developing technology, it's not just the technology; it's the workforce and it's the knowledge that goes into that technology. And we actually do have a sad history of making investments, building that knowledge base, and then letting it fritter away. Um, I'll give you one very recent example. We, 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 our organization just did a study of hypersonic wind tunnels uh, for the US government. And one of the things that we discovered is that we, we, we realized that there were some facilities that are at risk, but more importantly, the workforce is at risk. And so we put in a, a strong recommendation that attention be paid to, to, to building the workforce, supporting it but also making sure that they learn the lessons of how we got to where we are. Understand everything that went before so they, that, that they have the context, they have the knowledge base, so we don't lose that, that really, really hard-earned hard investment in, in developing that, those capabilities. Yeah, I think that's a good point because uh, even in our sort of micro environments of our, own, of our own workplaces, I think we all have seen stories, particularly those of us who've been at the particular institutions for a long time, that the, the corporate the corporate memory and the corporate insight um, is often something that's often uh, tossed aside uh, quite quickly, and it can go very quickly, particularly when generations of practitioners often pass as a group quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's always uh, uh, quite uh, quite important to keep that in mind. Um, uh, always like the uh, uh, the Mark Twain comment about about history. It, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. rhyme. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and yeah. 
uh, those of us who, were, who are dinosaurs of our own institutions uh, often can provide uh, some of the rhyming, the rhyming tunes for, uh, for uh, newer uh, uh, folks who, uh, who bring fresh insights to uh, those. So there's an important interplay between, between uh, um, institutional history as well as fresh perspective. And uh, again, always important for us all to, uh, to, to be ever mindful of that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think this is uh, probably a good uh, point to uh, uh, offer the opportunity for anyone in the audience to uh, bring forward questions or comments or participate in the discussion. Uh, do we have any, anybody with the courage to come up to the microphone? Uh, I was in a meeting a, a little while ago with Roger Lonius, and he was trying to convince me that he was shy and, and uh, introverted. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to call on Roger to, uh, to show us how shy he is. Hi, my name is Adrian Provenzano, and my question has to do with uh, the effect that the fact that most people, if they have any sort of connection with aircraft, it's as consumers, and not really in any other direct way as pilots. I don't have the flying plane I was promised by the Jetsons, you know, and um, so I'm kind of wondering if, as we're both looking back to history, if more of the general public had some more hands-on connection with aviation, maybe there would be a greater interest in the history as well as understanding how we might move forward. And if you have any suggestions for how to encourage that. Well, uh, if, I, if I may, just in terms from speaking from the museum setting that we're, that we're in here, uh, one of the things that uh, we try to do here at the Air and Space Museum is to really demonstrate through the objects and the exhibitions the range of careers and activities that are associated with aerospace. Uh, you know, we often talk that um, as wonderful as they are, uh, most of the people coming in this building will not become an astronaut, will not become a military fighter pilot or a commercial airline pilot, uh, will not be the first person to walk on the surface of Mars. But what you see, the objects here, represents thousands of people who contributed to those, to those goals. For every object that you see, someone designed it, someone built it, someone tested it, somebody formed a company to sell it, somebody marketed it. Um, so all of these objects really represent people, and the museum is really kind of the intersection of the hardware and the humanity. And uh, I think we can, uh, uh, those of us who are you know, aerospace geeks and just you know, love looking at the objects uh, for what they are and what they represent technically, uh, for most of our visitors and for most uh, 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 the folks who uh, walk the streets, these objects um, don't have that resonance, but mm -hmm. they do have messages that really talk about uh, where, where collectively we as a, as a society and as a species mm -hmm. have achieved what we have done. So the museum is a, is a wonderful setting for that place. So, so if I could, I'm actually going to disagree with your fundamental thesis. Okay. We are in the single most <laughs> visited museum on the mall. Uh, Roger, correct me. Is it the most visited on Earth? Well, we the say the world. <laughs> the world. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't tell you how many of my non-aerospace friends tell me they never get, you know, they, they come to the Washington, first place they come is Air and Space Museum. Um, Air Force Museum, incredibly mm -hmm. well visited. It's, um, it's, it's hard to get to. It's been all, people make, pri uh, make pilgrimages to Dayton, Ohio, just to see the Air Force Museum. A wonderful Remember, town, by the yes, way. Yes, wonderful town, <laughs> wonderful town. So I actually, I'm going to disagree with you. I think aviation truly has captured the popular imagination. And I would argue that it's because we have opened aviation up. I mean, I, I remember when I, when I was growing up, when I, when I was in elementary school, I, I had some cousins who were taking a trip to uh, Europe. And the whole family went to the airport to see them off in the airplane. And you know, it was like when, you used to get, when people used to go off on cruises. And I think back at how amazing that was. This was such, an, this, this was such a strange occurrence that a family member was getting on an airplane. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago. I'm not that old. Nowadays, could you ever imagine your family coming down to see you off on a trip to Italy or Europe? You'd think they were absolutely nuts because we've made it such a part of our everyday life. But I think that's a good thing because I think people actually get to experience flight. They get to sit in a magic device called an airplane. Mm -hmm. They get to hurtle through the atmosphere at almost the speed of sound at altitudes of 30,000 feet. It's, and, and I think it, it brings aviation home. But they, there's the fascination, and I agree with that, and that in part explains mm -hmm. why this museum is so popular. I often say, you know, this place is like a weed. No matter what we do, we can't kill it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Hopefully but no one's trying to. But I think that the, the next follow-on and the, and the more substantive 
element of that enthusiasm is sharing an understanding and an opportunity for people to understand how they can participate in that right. rather than right. just simply be right. awed by it. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that, that's kind of the point I was trying to make that I think we can appreciate the artifacts and seeing them and there definitely is a draw and people from around the world will come to the Kennedy Space Center, for example, right. Right. and they have a great enthusiasm about seeing where all that, of those things happen, for example, but then to take it to the next level of some kind of participation or wanting to have a... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we can make it. But I'm wondering about taking, getting more people involved in, um, you know, reading more about it, learning more about it, and actually then getting hands-on. Where we have a some people in our culture that are interested in the makers movement and the hands-on and and tinkering and doing that. But it, is it? Are we going to grow more in that direction, or is that going to still be a small segment of society? Because I'd love to see more people getting involved in aviation. And this is well, it's certainly a fundamental part of the mission here at the museum, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly uh, the history offices of other mm -hmm. institutions represented here. So um, well, we're so doing our is, part. This is, what, this is one place where, um, I mean, speaking as a historian, but uh, where it seems to me that UAVs might have a role. Yeah. Well, and, and there's, there's, there's actually a lot of outreach um, my husband and I. Noted. My husband and I are involved with something called Air Camp. Uh, it's for middle school students, where we bring them, um, and they they spend a week in Dayton, and at the Air Force Museum, and a few other places. They come from all over the country, um, and we we take them on flights, and we take them out to the research labs. But we found that we're not the only folks who were doing that. We thought when we came up with this idea of air camp, we would be the space camp of America. But there were actually things like this going on um, all across the country. So I think there, there are a lot of people who are understanding um, the hands-on uh, importance of this, especially at the middle school level. Um, and uh, so I, I think that there are a lot of people who are doing that. It's, it's not just the, the consumer thing. Uh, uh, pedagogy has changed for um, K-12. Uh, I think there's a lot of hands-on that's going on. Let me add one comment on that, though. When we do, uh, we've done a bunch of oral histories with people of the generation of, uh, who kind of grew up in the 20s and 30s and then studied, went on to become aeronautical engineers. Mm -hmm. I would say that 90% of them, when you talk to them about their childhood growing up, 90% of them built Model balsa wood right, models right. and mm -hmm. competed there's mm -hmm. contests mm -hmm. and you know the time aloft contest and almost to a person almost all of them played with those model airplanes as a kid yeah i think now what you'll find is that they were playing uh video games that are about aviation right. or they they went away to summer camp or something like that it, kind of just a uh, same idea just a different execution so it's out there. I just have to find it. So. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> By the way, you. I'm disappointed you didn't sing your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Our next question is from online. In order to do some or all of the things discussed, should the NACA be pulled from NASA so it is no longer overshadowed by space? Ghost of aerospace future? Well, yeah. okay, so there's the practical problem that the initials NSA have already been taken by another agency. Um, <laughs> you know, that suggestion comes up fairly often. I would actually argue no. And, and, and part of it is because um, it really is aerospace. Um, there, there is so much technology crossover between aviation and space. You know, you, you look at that space shuttle, which is in the back of the gallery. I mean, that's as much airplane as it is spacecraft. The hypersonic vehicles that I mentioned mm -hmm. are as much airplane as they are spacecraft. Controls technology, materials technology. So I actually do think that would be, that would be a mistake. And I, I even think that, that in the current environment, that could be worse for aviation than keeping it as part of NASA. Okay. Roger. All right. Shy person that I am, I'm here. Um, a little more than 25 years ago, Jim Hansen, who I'm sorry he's not here to participate in this part of the conversation, because uh, he had to get out of town before the snow, the, uh, published an article in Technology and Culture called Aviation History in the Wider View. And he suggested that there was a transition that was taking place in, in, the, in the history of aeronautics, and, and I guess to some level sp uh, space as well, moving beyond the, uh, the tail number 
compilers and that type of people, the, uh, the, the folks who loved the airplane in and of itself. Um, so my question is, plus 25 years after the, after the fact, do you agree that we have moved beyond that uh, particular approach to history? Uh, are there things that we ought to try to do uh, that would make aviation history, and in this particular case, the NACA's history, uh, have a wider view, so to speak? Uh, and, um, and, and how do the historians feel about that? And, and, and those who are non-historians as well. And then, more for you, Mark. <laughs> Since you were talking about pilotless aircraft and the potential for a pilotless transport, is the Air Force willing to accept that the F-35 is the last piloted fighter it's ever going to have? Thanks. Uh, well, in terms of uh, aerospace scholarship, I think you know, the answer to your question, Roger, is a resounding yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, not only reflected in the, uh, in the uh, growth of, of the literature that we see, professional scholar literature that we see, but also in terms of, of graduate students. Uh, I know when, when I was doing my degree, I was one of the very few people that is actually, you know, writing a dissertation on an aerospace topic. Uh, now is reflected in both the Air and Space Museum Fellowship Program, NASA uh, History uh, Fellowships, and so forth, and others. Um, you have a you know broad range of, of uh, young scholars uh, focusing on aerospace mm -hmm. topics from the outset. Um, and from a, a broad range of disciplines, um, uh, everything from the, the sort of traditional hardcore history of technology, engineering uh, analysis type of history to uh, looking at aerospace in art. Uh, we've, had, we've had art historians in our, in our mm -hmm. fellowship program here. Uh, and of course, all the range of uh, social, and, social and cultural history, gender studies, um, uh, race, race studies, those sorts of things. So certainly the wide review um, has, has emerged um, where we go uh, from the future, uh, I think, you know, continuing ever widening view, uh, but certainly uh, um, uh, as, a, as a discipline, uh, uh, it certainly has, if not uh, mm -hmm. matured, it's certainly uh, uh, gone out of birth and is into adolescence. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. often a matter of uh, imagination, thinking about what you could write. The, the other side of that, the, the, the downside of that is that a lot of those folks who are writing on gender or race or foreign policy or whatever wouldn't necessarily self-identify themselves as aviation historians or, or aerospace historians. The same thing happens in the field of urban history. Um, they, they're, they're doing studies of uh, class and culture and, and, and this, and they, they see themselves as social historians or political historians. Um, I think that SHOT and other organizations um, might uh, benefit from reaching out to some of these folks who are writing some of these more imaginative, broader view histories and um, uh, actively recruiting them into the fold and um, getting some of these younger uh, scholars to identify themselves um, as aerospace historians. Um, I, I realize on the job market, they may have to promote themselves as something else, but in their professional life, they certainly uh, could see themselves in, in those roles. And I think that in and of itself would refresh the field uh, constantly. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree. I think, uh, you know, in our, with our archival materials, we have a lot of interest from people doing labor history or environmental history, mm -hmm. uh, history of uh, race, class, or gender. Um, diplomatic history. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be good to. Um, I think it's. I think it's actually healthy for them to, you know, maintain their disciplinary identity and bring that to bear on what we think of as our subject, um, and bring in new perspectives on it. Uh, but I think a lot of times, sometimes they come without knowing the history of technology literature, specifically the history of aerospace literature. And I think that's where hopefully we can do, mm -hmm. as Janice does, do a better job of maybe saying, look, some of the stuff we've thought about uh, a little bit, um, and maybe you have to understand the technology, or it would help to understand some of the technological mm -hmm. questions to then inform your study of labor or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And now, now, Roger, so, so let, me, let me, if it's okay, let me, let me hand it. So Roger, it's been, it's been a many years since I could give you an official answer on behalf of the US Air Force, so I won't even go there. So I'll give you some personal thoughts. And, and let me start with a caveat that, that, you know, my, my general, I, I think it's been generally observed that, that knowledge tends to grow exponentially 
but we as human beings tend to think linearly, which means we have this habit of over-predicting in the near term and under-predicting in the far term, which is a convoluted way of explaining why we don't have those jets and flying cars yet. Um, having said that, um, my guess is, at least for the foreseeable future, I don't think we're ever going to, in, in our lifetimes, maybe in our kids' lifetimes, we're not, we won't see the, uh, an era when you have unmanned aircraft making autonomous decisions to, to commit violence. There's always going to be an operator, either in the air or on the ground at some point. I think that actually leads us to the solution where, where we, will, we will see perhaps the next generation, which is actually a combination of manned systems with unmanned systems. You know, I, I, I think in terms of maybe the, the manned F-30 whatever, F-30, F whatever the numbering will be, um, surrounded by the unmanned wingmen, if you will, that are maybe flying advanced, flying in support, doing other parts of the mission, almost as a constellation. That seems to be the direction. And also we might see the alternately manned or unmanned, the system that can have a human being in the cockpit or not, depending on, on the mission. Um, and that's probably as far as I, I, would, I would be willing to project right now. All right, so uh, Larry Burke, and uh, since my newly minted PhD is in history and policy, I was excited when you said that the Air Force brings in the historians every time they, yeah. they make a decision, yeah. Yeah. and then you said they're just there to record. No, 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 uh, no not just, no, no, no. I didn't say they're just there to record. Okay, well, that was... That One of the things they do is to record. Okay. They do more than that. All right, mm -hmm. well, it was really just an entry point. Yeah. Uh, so, regarding the, the, the unmanned vehicles, mm -hmm. and starting with the most recent point of whether the the military is going to ever go unmanned. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think the issue there is that so far we've seen unmanned military vehicles operating in a safe environment, a free environment. They have not been opposed. Right. And I, I do think we will have to look into what happens when unmanned vehicles are getting into air-to-air -air combat with either manned vehicles or unmanned vehicles. Um, but in the, the broader question of will we be getting into a pilotless commercial flight uh, and I've given this some thought, I, I think it really has to be either we keep the pilots or there will be completely autonomous with no pilot backup. Uh, the reason is, if the pilot is there for backup, but the plane is flying itself all the time, where is the pilot going to get the experience to take over? Um, but the other thing is, I, I think we will see, you know, it's a, it's a public perception. Right now we freak out about it. Uh, right now we're freaking out about autonomous cars, but we're getting a little bit more accepting. Uh, I'm sure in the mid-1920s, people would have freaked out when uh, you know, the Air Force was working on blind flight at the thought of getting into a plane where the pilot could not see what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that is as much a social issue of social acceptance uh, of, of what we're willing to look at. Um, I thought there was something else, but I can't come up with it now. So I'll let you guys respond to that. It's all yours. Oh, my. So, okay. So, so I, I, I would generally agree. You, the first part of your, your, your comments, I think, are very well taken. That, that you know, military organizations are often accused of fighting the last war, and you know, we've we've seen tremendous success in in the use of of unmanned systems. But that's been in conflicts where they weren't really at significant risk. And so I, I think the question you pose is, is, is absolutely uh, correct. Um, your comments on, un, on, on manned, unmanned, uh, I, I think you also raised some interesting points. And at the very least, it, 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 it points to some pedagogical, pedagogical, pedagogical issues. You know, how do you keep your pilots trained? Maybe there's a way to keep them trained. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, that, 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 that doesn't seem to be out of the, out of the realm of the, the, the possible. Well, what comes to mind is if God had meant man to fly, he would have given them wings. Yeah. Um, we had to convince people that they could fly in the first place. So, um, or that um, you could have a box in your living room that would bring entertainment into your, uh, into your own home. Um, we, uh, Americans in particular seem to embrace new technologies with great enthusiasm. Um, and even though we might not uh, think of it before, maybe they need a Steve Jobs to convince us that this is a technology that we never knew we wanted but now have to have. Um, yeah. So it, it'll be an education thing. 
um, and um, it, it generally takes more time than we usually think it should. I, I would say the good news is one of the things we've actually learned from, from research in autonomous systems is that is it turns out to be relatively easier to build an autonomous aircraft than it does to build an autonomous car. Right? Mm -hmm. Even though you've got that extra dimension that you're dealing with, there, there aren't stop signs and pedestrians mm -hmm. crossing in the atmosphere. So, so it actually makes the problem a little bit more tractable. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I think there's another reason it's more tractable. The thing I always wonder about autonomous cars, I, I, I take as a given that you can build a car that can stay in the lane and uh, you know, avoid the woman pushing the baby across the street at the right time. Um, it, it seems to me that requires the proper maintenance of all the sensors on board your autonomous system. Mm -hmm. And just looking around some of the cars in my neighborhood, I'm not sure that all my neighbors would make sure that their camera lenses aren't smudged and their other sensors aren't smudged. Whereas in aviation, I think we'd have more of a sense that, that, that because of the history that we've got, because of the traditions that we've got, mm -hmm. that maintaining those autonomous systems would be more reliable. And remember, autonomous cars were first predicted at least at Futurama in uh, 1938 and mm -hmm. 39, right. the World's Fair. Right. So um, often takes a lot more time than we yep. think. Another question from our online audience. How do you get the public interest across the larger technical and physical divides of aerospace? And more importantly, maintain that interest when space travel is not yet a daily reality for the average citizen? Well, there again, uh, you know, most of our visitors are not going to be on the first spacecraft to Mars, but they are going to be able to have an opportunity if, they, if that interest is sparked to participate in creating that technology. So uh, I think it's, it's that continual education of just uh, enlightening uh, the public the incredible breadth of what aerospace engineering is. Some, you know, the, the old uh, uh, adage that there's no such thing as aerospace engineering, it's just all the other engineering is all brought together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's uh, the case, whether it be in terms of the technical development or the uh, systems, the ground mm -hmm. systems to support it, uh, that you can really just demonstrate how exciting aerospace is by just showing how broad and wide it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, you mentioned ground facilities. That um, a few years ago, I reviewed an article for the Journal of the American Planning Association, which was about spaceports and how to plan for spaceports. Uh, the interest is out there, um, and I, I think um, uh, it may not be as hard to get the public interested in it as, as that question might suggest. I, I guess I'd point out, and my friends at NASA like to, like to point out that that the Opportunity rover has more Twitter followers than mm -hmm. Justin Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I would, again, argue that it's actually captured considerable popular attention. Yeah, and I think NASA has an easier problem than uh, many other uh, public agencies. Yeah. Right. Steve Flanagan and all the discussion about automation, and I'm just thinking that, you know, it was probably 30 years ago when we heard that the airliner cockpit of the future would have a pilot and a dog with the... <laughs> the pilot is there to feed the dog and the dog is there to bite the pilot if he tries to fly the airplane. <laughs> yeah. And really it was 40 years ago that we heard that the Lindenwald line, it was a really hard decision for them and it was a, you know, it was a fundamental decision. Were they going to go fully automated? And they came to the conclusion that if people saw what looked like a cockpit and nobody was in it, the people that were on the platform would basically be, you know, they'd be reluctant. First time you had an accident, the whole system would probably come to a halt. So, the how much for the automation, you know, is is uh, we've had that for a good long time, and whether or not people can get with, you know, can accept that or not, I don't know. But I thought the point that you had made, uh, which is to say that how do you get more people involved and interested in aviation, and I think some of what you had here was an indication of it, where you see people who say, hey, I spent a whole life or I spent a whole career in it, and it was fun. You know, if you can do more of that, I think that kind of helps towards getting some of the outreach to which you tell people, okay, the world's gonna be different, I can't build the Boeing 747, but if I'm working at a UAS company, it looks like I'll have steady business for a while, so, just an offering, is, which is to say there that one of the nice parts about all this was to see all the people who did well and had a good time while they were doing it. I would just say I think the problem is not getting people interested in uh, aircraft or spaceflight, but it's um, 
as I understand NASA's problem, it's getting uh, the younger people interested in the science and engineering and mathematics that will then lead them into mm -hmm. careers in that, and that actually it's almost you turn it around that the a aircraft and the space are the way to uh, get them interested uh, in and on and yeah. on the yeah, STEM yeah. as on the path to um, uh, becoming the p kind of people who can build the planes or the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Glenn Bugos. So I was surprised to see that the three panelists Oh, so let me tell you a little bit about how I've seen the um, conversations within NASA about how to celebrate the NACA uh, centenary played out. There are those within the aerospace community that said this is really our centenary. The NACA was involved in aviation. It solved those problems of aviation. Um, NASA continues to take the same basic industry support approach from 1958 to the present in terms of what the aeronautics research mission uh, directorate does. Those within the spaceflight community are saying, well, you know, the NACA really was the DNA of NASA, that uh, people came from the NACA centers, and that's how we got into uh, human spaceflight. And then I'll put myself in a camp that said we really need to respect this 1958 cutoff, and perhaps that's because I'm an historian, but things really changed in terms of the relationship between uh, this set of people, this federal government, uh, federal agencies, and what America was doing um, in looking into aerospace. So I guess my first question is, was that really your intent to say that uh, when you were looking at the next page in this history, it was what happened between 1958 uh, and the present in aeronautics, as opposed to the rest of space that really deserves uh, some attention. And if not, if you were looking at the period before 1958, are there topics that you would have expected to see at a conference like this in dealing with NACA history that really should have had more attention? Well, um I'm not sure. If, uh, were you just talking to me, or were you? <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I thought about this actually when I was uh, thinking about my possible comments, and um, because it did seem to be an issue with um, the talks here, and um, the fact that there were not very many talks on the post-1958, or you know, some of the talks went into the 60s, but then not a whole lot on you know the 70s, 80s, and forward. Um, and I agree that I think that. Um, 1957-1958 is a is a turning point uh, with the entrance of space and the competition for resources and whatnot and the new agency. Um, I think for the earlier period, uh, if there are papers that I would have liked to have seen more, it would have been more kind of the social history of NACA and more about the types of people who worked there. And um, we learned a lot about some of the technical history, history of technology, but more about these outside. Uh, outside views of labor history, environmental history. Mm -hmm. um, we have not heard very much uh, or if anything about uh, the environment um, here. Uh, so those kinds of things for the earlier period and then just for the later period, just I think since there were some legacies, and airplanes didn't go away, we're still flying in them. I'm gonna get in one, hopefully I'm gonna get in one and fly home yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, and I'm gonna hope to God somebody's done their homework on de-icing. But, um, <laughs> uh, so the problems haven't gone away and there, you know, aeronautics research is still a however many billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a substantial national investment and there's uh, history that needs to be written about what that money and what those people uh, were doing. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think you do look at it as 100 years, but recognizing that, you know, it's almost the semantic problem. Do we call it NACA or do we call it <laughs> NASA? Um, but it's a problem, but I think there are reasons to look at, uh, try to look at both of them. Well, I think, uh, unless you have no, a final no, comment, no, uh, just okay. we're kind of, uh, since we're on the, uh, on the clock here and, uh, uh, the, the camera's plug will be pulled if we don't, so, uh, so we have a nice finish. Uh, I think it was a really, uh, rich and interesting, uh, final discussion for the, uh, the end of the conference and uh, setting a nice stage for uh, future uh, uh, work that uh, many of our colleagues who had in attendance could pursue. And uh, I think I just want to um, thank all the, the participants and the panelists and, and those who attended, uh, our online visitors. Thank you for uh, tuning in and, uh, and contributing questions and part of the discussion as well. And again, a final thank you to the organizers and all the, all the support folks who uh, put this on and uh, made it all work. Uh, it's, been a great, it's been a great conference, and uh, I'm really uh, uh, personally glad that uh, we could host it here at the Air and Space Museum and uh, continue our uh, wonderful partnership.
partnership with NASA and the other agencies that uh, not only do the history of this uh, technology, but also uh, push us into the future. So thanks to everyone, and I think uh, that's all, folks. Thank you.